In 2005, for the 20th anniversary of Larry King's life, Barbara Waters interviewed Larry King, the man who became famous interviewing others. She asked him candid and direct questions. Two questions stood out in that interview. The first is, what is your greatest fear? Larry King immediately replied with one word, death. Her follow-up question was, do you believe in God? King replied, not sure, I'm an agnostic. Regardless of our accomplishments or net worth, regardless of our influence or power, regardless of our success or status, if we are uncertain about God, we will be uncertain and fearful about death. But here's the good news. The fear of death dissolves when we walk with the one who walked out of the tomb. Only one person in history did that on his own power, and his name is Jesus. The whole Gospel of Mark shouts out his name, and Mark points us to a life-giving faith in Jesus Christ alone. In Mark chapter 9, verse 7 and 8, it reads, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Life-giving faith is so necessary but so misunderstood. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1 to 29, we can capture two important things that makes a decisive difference in our faith. In whom we place our faith, verse 1 to verse 13, and by what we develop our faith from verse 14 to verse 29. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to understand and to apply these truths in our lives. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, once again, open our eyes to behold wonderful truth out of your word. Open our eyes to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Help us to know him, walk with him, and put our faith in Him and grow in a strong faith in our walk with Jesus. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. First, in whom we place our faith makes all the difference in our faith. It brings us from the fear zone into the faith zone. Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to verse 4 records, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and up in the mountain transfigured before them. Here's the question. Why only the three? Wouldn't more be better? Yup, let, let's bring the twelve up to the mountain as well. And come to think of it, if Jesus was going to reveal his glory, it shouldn't be just the twelve, and it shouldn't be up a secluded mountain. Hey, why not organize a mega worship festival right in the center of Jerusalem and there reveal the glory of Jesus in his transfiguration? But that would miss the whole point. For Jesus has no interest in being a glorified exhibitionist. Hey guys, look, tada, super messiah. Rather, the purpose of the transfiguration was an authentication to substantiate his claims. The narrative of the transfiguration must be considered in the whole narrative context. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus gave a prophecy. He foretold of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And then to validate the truth of his prophecy, the prophecy came with a promise. Jesus promised in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after he has come with power. 
until they see the kingdom of God come with power. In the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John caught a glimpse of his magnificent kingdom glory. The Greek word is metamorphote, from which we get the word metamorphosis, the process by which a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Metamorphote means to change the external form. The transfiguration narrative is thus the celebration of the invisible made visible. It was more an unveiling than a transformation. It simply unveils Jesus' true identity and glory, the glory that he already had right from the beginning. If I transfigured before you, that will be a transformation. But for Jesus, it was not so much a transformation, it was more an unveiling of who he actually already really is. And in the transfiguration, suddenly out of nowhere, Elijah and Moses appeared and talked with Jesus. Here's the question. Why Moses and Elijah? What about Job, Abraham, Joseph, David, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the other Old Testament luminaries? And these two spiritual giants, Elijah and Moses, were talking with Jesus. Wow, I wish I could just listen in to the conversation. It would have made a fantastic webinar. What exactly were they talking with Jesus about? The answer goes right back to the purpose of the transfiguration. First of all, these two men were there not because of their merits, but because of what they represent, the law represented by Moses and the prophets represented by Elijah. To do what? To testify to the truth that the Messiah must suffer and die in order to atone for the sins of humanity. And most importantly, Moses and Elijah were there to endorse that this singular sacrificial act of love fulfills all that the law requires and all that the prophets testify to. And what were Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about? Or wouldn't we like to know? The Gospel of Mark is silent. But Luke chapter 9, verse 31 tells us, they spoke about his departure and he was talking about what is to come and the fulfillment that was to come at Jerusalem. In other words, they were conversing about his death, his suffering and the salvation that would come in his atoning sacrifice. Now, Peter, James and John were terrified by the glory of Jesus and in the presence of Moses, they witnessed the transfiguration. Peter quickly suggested to erect three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Mark chapter 9, verse 6 says, For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And verse 7 and verse 8 tells us that a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And then as they looked around, they saw no one else. Moses was gone, Elijah was gone, but Jesus only. But Jesus only. Aidan Rogers was a Southern Baptist pastor who served three terms as the distinguished president of the Southern Baptist Convention. This is what Aidan Rogers brilliantly wrote about Jesus. He came the first time to die. He's coming again to raise the dead. When he came the first time, they questioned whether he was king. The next time the world will know that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The first time he wore a crown of thorns. The next time he will be wearing a crown of glory. The first time he came in poverty. The next time he's coming in power. The first time he had an escort of angels, the next time he will come with tens of thousands of his saints. The first time he came in his meekness, 
He is coming again in His majesty. But only Jesus. Listen to Him. You see, whom we place our faith in makes all the difference. Listen to Him, the voice says. We say, I am anxious. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I am confused. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I have deep regrets. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I am fearful. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I am hurt. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I'm so angry by the betrayal. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, it is hopeless. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, it is unfair. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I cannot forgive. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I have deep doubts. The voice says, listen to Him. We say, I struggle with addiction. The voice says, listen to Him. Oh, we say, we have lost so much. The voice says, listen to Him. Whatever your condition in life, however you journey through life with its ups and downs, listen to Him. For as we journey through life, we must understand the principle of the two voices. There are two voices competing for our attention and our allegiance. The voice of God and other voices. But one will drown out the other. So we must choose and we must choose wisely which voice we give heed to. Otherwise, the other voices will drown out the voice of God. There are two voices. Which voice do you listen to? The Bible says there is a voice from heaven saying, this is the Christ, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The disciples needed to hear that. And we need to hear that too. Listen to him. That is why it's so important for us to get into the scriptures, the word of God. Because through the Word of God, we hear the voice of God. We know of the leading of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. This is the foundation of our faith, the living Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. It is through the Scriptures that we listen to God. It's in the Scriptures that we know God. It's in the Scriptures that we are tutored by God. If we don't know the Scriptures, if we don't have the Bible in our life, our faith is shallow. We don't have a solid foundation for our faith. Listen to Him. Get in the Scriptures. Get in the Scriptures and you will listen to Him. If we want to move from the fear zone to the faith zone, we got to understand this principle. Listen to Him. That is why my encouragement is get back to the Holy Scriptures. Spend time in the Word of God because this, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, is the foundation of our faith. It will move us from the fear zone to the faith zone because this is the Word of God and in it we find the voice of God. Okay, we must move on. Two things that make a decisive difference in our faith. First, in whom we place our faith. We place our faith in Jesus and Jesus is revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The second, by what we develop our faith. Our faith is deepened and developed not by a magic formula. The Bible is not a magic formula. Just knowing the Bible as mere knowledge, that is not going to build our faith. So when I say get back to the Word of God, I'm not talking about mere Bible knowledge, mere cognitive knowledge. When I say get back to the Word of God, I'm talking about an encounter with God. I'm talking about moving from the ha to the hmm, to the aha, to the wow. 
in late July, I just finished a class in, in New York, uh, in a deeming class. And it was a four-hour lecture over Zoom. And at the end of the four hours, I left the doctoral student with one exaltation, one encouragement. And the one encouragement is, don't be satisfied with just leadership principles. The course was on leadership. And the point I want to make is, don't just walk away with the, aha, I, I know these principles. Wow, I got these insights. Don't be satisfied with just the aha. Move into the wow. Move into the sanctuary of God. That's how I begin with all my classes. Not welcome to the class, but welcome to the sanctuary of God. Because you see, faith comes and faith is developed when we encounter God. When we encounter God in the Holy Scriptures, it's not by some magic formula. It's not by some overzealous proclamations. It's not by presumptuousness. It's not even by past experiences. And it's not by a second-hand faith, a faith that is borrowed by somebody else's faith. How then is true biblical faith developed? Let's look at the narrative in Mark chapter 9 and learn from it. Immediately after the transfiguration, Jesus and his three disciples descended from the mountain top to meet the disciples below. Now here's what unfolded below while Jesus was up in the mountain. A lad was being tormented by a demon. He would throw himself into the fire. He would throw himself into the water. He would have been burned or drowned if not for the vigilance of his concerned caregivers. In vain, his family who cared for him, they tried so hard to help him. Until finally, at wit's end, the desperate father brought this demonized son to Jesus. But Jesus wasn't around. He was up in the mountain. So the father asked the disciples of Jesus for deliverance of his son. They gathered around, they tried to cast out the demon, but nothing happened. It was one of the most embarrassing situations the disciples have ever faced. They could not cast out the demon. They tried valiantly but failed miserably. It was not for the lack of trying. They were simply out of their depth. For no matter what they tried, nothing happened until Jesus came. And with divine authority, Jesus cast out the demon instantaneously. The son was delivered. The father was grateful. The public was awed. And as for the disciples, they were astonished. Oh, why, Lord? Why couldn't we cast out the demon? They asked him in private. Mark gave us a brief summarized reply in verse 29. This kind come cannot be driven out by anything but by prayer. In other words, you got to fully depend on God. Now to understand this further, let's examine the parallel text in Matthew chapter 17. For in Matthew chapter 17 verse 19 to 20, this is what we piece together on that particular episode. The disciples came to Jesus and privately they asked him, why could we not cast out the demon? And in verse 20, Jesus said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. First, notice what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say your technique is wrong. The problem wasn't one of methodology. Nor did Jesus say, you simply didn't try hard enough. The problem wasn't one of diligence. Nor did Jesus say, because you are not smart enough. The issue wasn't one of intelligence. Nor did Jesus say, because you didn't persevere through. The problem wasn't one of perseverance. Nor did Jesus say, because the demons were too fierce for you. The issue wasn't the power of the demons. 
These things weren't factored in at all in Jesus' equation and reply. Rather, Jesus put his finger on the most significant thing, because of the littleness of your faith. You see, the central issue here was faith. And the disciples thought, we have the faith. We, we came in the name of God and in your name, Master, we tried to cast out the demon. Nothing happened. We have the faith, but nothing happened. You see, here's the principle. There's a great difference between faith in faith and faith in God. Oh, Jesus circumvented their expectations and ours. For we would have expected Jesus to say something like this, because of the littleness of your faith, therefore, if only you have a greater faith or a bigger faith, or if only you have a deeper faith, or come on disciples, if only you have a fuller faith, yes, if only you have faith as big as a mountain. Jesus didn't say that. Instead, Jesus said the opposite. If you have faith, even if it were as small as a mustard seed. Now, small as a mustard seed was a common idiom that referred to something unusually small. So at first glance, it seemed almost sarcastic. Why couldn't you cast out the demons? Because of the littleness of your faith. But in fact, if you had just a mustard seed faith, it would have done the job. You don't have faith at all. But circum this sarcasm wasn't what the Lord intended here. Upon hearing the littleness of the faith, I guess and imagine the disciples must have scratched their heads and thought to themselves, yeah, if only we had more faith. But, but we thought we had faith. And Jesus masterfully preempted that fallacy of thinking. His point in effect was this, guys, you totally missed it. You see, it's not the size of your faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have real God-inspired faith, even if it were as small as a mustard seed, you could move mountains. Now, moving mountains was a figure of speech. It denotes that which is difficult or impossible or incomparably tough. You see, the focus was not on the size of their faith, but the size of their God. The size of God. Get this, Jesus wasn't highlighting the diminutiveness of their faith, but the defectiveness of their faith. It wasn't about how small their faith was, but rather how flawed their faith was. When will we ever learn that it's not about us, that it's all about God? Not even the size of our faith, but the size of our God. The defective faith they have was faith in faith rather than faith in God. You see, Jesus was saying in effect, the kind of faith you have, which you thought was great faith, was in fact by contrast, little faith. Because the eyes of your faith was focused upon past successes, past experiences. The focus of your faith was past techniques, past accomplishments, say the right thing, some magic formula, rather than upon God's glory and God's power and God's presence to cast out the demons. If you have true faith in God, a mustard seed faith would have sufficed. You see, dear people of God, in God's economy, size isn't everything. Not the size of our faith, nor was it about the size of the mountain or the size of the difficulty. Why? Because God outsized them all. To have faith in faith is something that is man-centered, anthropocentric. I have faith. I have faith that this faith will work out. To have faith in God is theocentric. The focus is entirely on God, His will, His purposes, His wisdom, His leading, His agenda. 
And, and so to have faith in God is, is a place of restedness and surrender. God, I have no agenda of my own. For your purpose, in the light of your will, for your glory, Lord, would you do this? And if it's not for your will, if it's not unto your glory, if your wisdom does not allow for this, I am submitted to you. I am surrendered to you. Because faith is an expression of our surrender. Our expression of surrender is an expression of our love and our knowledge of God. You, you cannot divorce the two together. That's why we develop our faith, not just by some cognitive knowledge of the Word of God. We develop our faith by an encounter of God, by knowing who God is. And, and because we know who He is and the love He has for us, we surrender to Him. And in that surrender to God, His purposes, His agenda, His will, we are rested because it's not about our will, our agenda, our likings, our prayer, our faith. When will we ever learn? It's not about us. It's all about God. We got to bring back that vitality of faith, that robustness of faith. And when we have that kind of faith, surrender to the agenda of God and to the will of God to fulfill the purpose of God for the glory of God, then all things are possible for those who believe in God. So we go back to Mark chapter 9, verse 23. It says, all things are possible for the one who believes. Look, all things are possible. Really? Let me give you an example. If I come and I lay down large, empty suitcases before God, and I say, Lord, all things are possible. So I close the suitcases, empty suitcases, and I pray with great faith. Oh God, I believe you are mighty. I believe all things are possible possible. These are empty suitcases around here. Would you fill them up with 10 million euros? And then I pray for an hour, open up the suitcases still empty. I pray for two hours, open up the suitcases still, still empty. I say, Lord, I want to develop great faith. And so I pray with mighty faith. I pray for four more hours with great faith that God will fill the empty suitcases with 10 million euros. Would it work? Let's try another one for size. The global pandemic, the virus. Oh Lord, I believe with great faith that all things are possible. I therefore pray that the pandemic virus will totally disappear globally in the next three seconds. Three, two, one. We don't need a vaccine. It is gone. All things are possible. Really? If those things don't happen, then what do we make of the promise of Jesus when He said, all things are possible to those who believe? No, I could say, I have great faith for the suitcases to be filled with 10 million euros. And why stop at 10 million? Why not 100 million? Or I could say, Lord, I have great faith for the pan pandemic to be blown over. What, what about this promise? All things are possible, Lord. You see, there's a great difference between all things are possible as opposed to anything is possible. What's the difference? Anything is possible is man-centered, anthropocentric. Our will, our agenda, our purpose, our wishes. Then God is nothing but like a genie in the lamb and, and we, we rub the lamb and God comes up, yes, master, what's your wishes? And we say, Lord, 10 million or 100 million euro. And, and Lord, by the way, uh, could you clear the pandemic, etc., etc. And, and then we imagine God says, yes, you have faith. Yes, master, I will do it. It's like, what? We miss it all together. When Jesus said all things are possible, there is a context and the context means nothing is impossible with God. If God wants to do it, it's not an impossibility with Him. But the question is, is that the agenda and purpose and wisdom of God in answering these mere wishes of mortal man? And we must understand the promise of Jesus within the context and the context is the deliverance of the demonized boy. So when Jesus said to the Father, nothing is impossible. All things are possible for those who believe. Within the context of the deliverance of the boy, Jesus is saying nothing is hopeless because there's power with God. 
Here are therefore two of the most important lessons in building true faith. Put your faith in Jesus alone. Listen to Him. Listen in His Word. Listen in your encounter and surrender to God. Listen to Him so that when you grow in that restedness, grow in that surrender, grow in that joy of the presence of God, then you won't come to say, Lord, my will be done. What about the 100 million euro? What, what about the pandemic? My will be done. Rather, we will say, Lord, you have your wisdom in all things. You have your time for all things. You have your agenda for all things. Not my will, but your will be done. Put your faith in Jesus alone and listen to Him. Because the greatest problem of mankind it is not poverty that trillions of dollars was, would uh, deliver us from. No, the greatest problem of mankind it is not the, the deliverance on the pandemic. No, the greatest problem of mankind is the problem of sin and the need for redemption in Christ Jesus. And the Bible tells us, Jesus loved us so much, He came to die on the cross for our sins to save us from the greatest problem of mankind the problem of sin. And with sin, the Bible says, all of us have sinned, we come short of the glory of God and the result, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, in Jesus alone. And the second way we build faith is to put aside a defective faith in faith and to embrace a devoted faith in Jesus. So lay hold of Jesus, lay aside your pride, your fears, your doubts and embrace the will of God in humble dependence and prayer and lay hold of Jesus. If you are not yet a Christian, then today I invite you in the light of the Word of God, give your life to Jesus. By faith say to Him, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross to solve humanity's greatest problem, to solve my problem of sin. Lord, forgive my sin. Come into my life and change me. That's the greatest miracle. That's the power of God. And there's nothing impossible with God. God frees us from our sin and gives us newness of life. I promise you, when you come to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, God sets you free and there is a newness of life in Him. And for those of us who are Christians, when we come to the Lord and say, Lord, help us to walk by faith, I promise you, you walk in this faith of the Word of God, even demons will flee. But you just got to take the step of true faith. Not faith in faith, but faith in God. True faith, even if it's the faith, the mere size of a mustard seed. Because when you take that step of faith, God comes into your life so that whatever challenges you face, the presence of God, the power of God, the promises of God are made near and true. Let me close with a true story that moved me. A house was caught on fire. A son, a young boy was forced to flee to the roof. The father called to the boy, Son, jump, I will catch you. Oh, at first the firemen were below, calling up to the boy, and the boy was terrified. But then he heard the father's voice, Son, jump, I will catch you. But all the boy could see, however, was flame and black smoke, and he was sorely afraid. And he cried out, Daddy, I can't see you. And the father replied, but I can see you, son, and that's all that matters. Jump, son, I will catch you. The boy jumped because he trusted his father and he was saved. We too have the promises and the assurance of God in trying times. And God is saying to us, daughter, son, I can see you and it's all that matters. Take that step of faith. Move from that fear zone to that faith zone. Not a faith in faith, but a faith in God. 
A faith that is rooted in the Word of God. A faith that comes to an encounter with God. A faith that is derived by a surrender to God. That's the power of faith. Would you bow with me and pray? Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you and pray, Lord, as we learn from Mark chapter 9, would you build a deep and true faith in us? For those of us, Lord, who have yet to know you, who have yet to open our heart with an invitation for Jesus to come into our lives, this day I pray that there will be an opening of the heart. My friends, as you bow before the presence of God in prayer, if you have never made this invitation for Jesus to come into your life, if you have not called out to Him by faith before, right now I'd like to lead you to do it. It's a simple prayer. Prayer itself is a declaration and an expression of faith. It's a prayer to say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Would you pray that? Because the Bible says, all of us have sinned. I have sinned. You have sinned from God's point of view, from His holiness. We all have fallen short. And so we come humbly in repentance and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me and change me. If you have prayed that prayer, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, come into my life. And you believe it in faith. The Lord comes into your life and change you from this day forward and bring you into His glorious family. For the many of us who are Christians watching this, I want to pray for you as I pray for myself that we will continue to walk in true faith, grow in true faith by putting our faith in the one who deserves our faith, the Lord Jesus. And by building our faith upon the foundation of God's Word, the encounter with God, the surrender to God. Because all things are possible for those who believe. Because nothing is impossible with God. So surrender to Him, not our agenda, not our will. Surrender to Him because we know our Father knows best. And saying to us, no matter what your the circumstance is, even in the midst of darkness, even in the midst of smoke or fire, in the difficulties of the circumstance, jump son, jump daughter son, jump. Take the leap of faith. I can see you and it's all that matters. Would you take that step of faith? Oh Lord Jesus, I pray that you help us to enter through the corridor of faith. And through the portals of faith, enter the presence of God. That our lives will be rested and surrendered to His presence. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.